So, uh, again, we're going to be moving up the spinal cord today. First part is all about conscious uh, sensation. Two major pathways there. You should already know these. What are our two major sensory pathways in the spinal cord? <coughs> PCML, fantastic, and the anterolateral pathway, more specifically spinal thalamic tract. That's going to hit the thalamus and then eventually the cortex, and that's where the magic happens. We perceive uh, something, either someone's touching us or something hurts. It depends on which pathway we're talking about. Uh, there's also some unconscious sensation that goes on. So anything that doesn't make it all the way to the cortex is still going to have some influence on nervous system function. Part of this might be in refining motor output via the cerebellum, and part of it might be gating painful signaling uh, that's trying to make its way up the spinal cord. Uh, you've all probably heard of the placebo effect, something like that. This is a, a real big problem in pain research because we have endogenous nociceptive or anti nociceptive uh, pathways that are going to blunt pain signaling. Regardless of what you do, your nervous system is eventually going to turn down chronic pain. And we'll see how that works in the last part of the lecture. So we'll start our journey up the spinal cord. At this point, we know uh, how we communicate with uh, muscles and skin, at least a little bit. The activation of those A beta, A delta, and C fibers uh, is going to lead to activation along the posterior column medial meniscus pathway for tactile sensation. And then, in this case, the spinal thalamic tract is what we're talking about because this is conscious perception. But there are other components of the anterolateral pathway. We'll get to those in the next point. <clears throat> um, I realize that we do have a face, we feel on our face, but this doesn't really involve the spinal cord, so we're going to brush it under the rug for now and forget about our face until the next unit. We'll bring it back up. Pretty simple though, trigeminal nerve, close to the thalamus, it's called the trigeminal thalamic tract. You don't need unit three anymore. Uh, we'll touch that again. Though. What we're focusing on here is what happens in the spinal cord. So, here below. For tactile sensation, this is going to be your posterior columns in the spinal cord. Posterior meaning they're in the back and columns because they're columns that run up the back of the spine. So the name makes sense. Don't overthink it. We separate this into two different components based on whether we're in the lower part of the body or near the ground. That will be our gracile uh, fasciculus. That's going to be the um, tract and then that's going to hit the gracile nucleus in the medulla. So the, the primary afferent here is going to go from somewhere out there in the body to the medulla. That's its job. It doesn't cross. So the tactile sensation remains uncrossed within the spinal cord. We're going to cross once we get the medulla and form the medial meniscus pathway. That's our secondary afferent. So the secondary neuron here is the one that's going to cross. This is also going to be true in the spinal thalamic tract as well. So the second one crosses whether it's painful or not. The difference is where the secondary afferent lies. So for non-painful sensation, it's up in the medulla. For the lower extremities, we're going to be gracile. For upper body, cuneate. And this will come up again whenever we're talking about our cerebellar tracts. Uh, so you'll hear cuneate again later on. And there's an organization within our posterior columns. Those that arise earlier, well, lower down in the spinal cord are going to be more medial. So your gracile fasciculus is going to be medial, and the cuneate fasciculus is going to be more lateral. So there's an organization from a neck to toe, going lateral to medial. So they're going to encounter different nuclei in the medulla. The name's still going to be consistent, either gracile or cuneate. Those are going to project across the midline locally in the medulla, and then on up to hit the thalamus. So here's where we cross. Now we're contralateral from the medulla up. The tertiary neuron in the thalamus is then going to project to the primary somatosensory cortex. And this creates our conscious perception of touch. 
So if something is happening down here in our leg, those afferents get stimulated, they project on up the gracile fasciculus to the gracile nucleus, cross over, head up to the ventral posterior lateral nucleus of the thalamus, and then they project on up into portions of the cortex that deal with the leg. So there's still a map here too, from head to toe. We maintain these body maps throughout so that location actually means something. So we maintain an organization that, that fits with our body all throughout, whether we're in the, the posterior columns here, whether we're in the medulla, whether we're in the thalamus, or most importantly, when we're in the cortex. So we have some idea of where tactile sensation is taking place. Three neurons. We can all handle that. The antral lateral pathway is going to have a few different offshoots along the way. We're just going to talk about spinal thalamic in this first part. And again, three neurons. That's all we're dealing with. The primary afferent is still out there in the skin, but in this case, it's going to be your A delta and C fibers. So those pain sensing neurons that are going to pick up changes in temperature and pH. Those neurons are going to synapse locally in the spinal cord. You can see that down here. So they're going to synapse in the dorsal horn onto the secondary afferents. These are going to cross within the spinal cord. Within a couple of spinal segments as they ascend, they're going to cross the midline. So within the spinal cord, we're crossed for pain and temperature sensation unlike tactile sensation, which remains uncrossed throughout the spinal cord. No crossing until you hit the medulla. Not true for temperature and pain. That's going to cross in the spinal cord. Yeah? This is still the primary? Secondary at this point. Secondary crosses. If we're crossing, it's a secondary afferent. But it is in the spinal cord. If this were the posterior column medial meniscus pathway, absolutely it would be a primary, but it's not, so it is. The primary afferent only uh, goes from skin, muscle, joint, to dorsal horn, then crosses over. And it's going to run in the anterior and lateral portion of the spinal cord, hence the name anterolateral pathway. We're not seeing the offshoots, but we will soon enough. As it ascends from spinal cord on up to thalamus, we're going to have some offshoots along the way to innervate different brain stem nuclei, and we'll see what they, those do later on. We're going to hit the thalamus to encounter our tertiary neuron. We're going to hit the same area as before, ventral, posterior, lateral nucleus of the thalamus. And that will again project on up to the primary somatosensory cortex so we know where we hurt. That emotional response and uh, the arousal that happens when we're hurt deals with the other thalamic nuclei that are targeted by our secondary affects. So there's a few different tertiary neurons here. All are in the thalamus though, but in different parts of it, and thus they connect to different parts of the cortex. We'll hear these again whenever we talk about the thalamus, but we'll hear them now too. Medial dorsal nucleus. Uh, when you hear this, you should think limbic system. Emotion, memory. So those Secondary nociceptive afferents are going to create some sort of emotional response and we're probably going to remember that so we don't do it again because we're going to target the medial dorsal nucleus and this is going to recruit emotional and memory circuits in the limbic system. So, pain sucks right here. Where is the pain? How do I feel about it? The arousal comes from the interlaminar nuclei of the thalamus. These are kind of diffuse. They're spread out throughout the thalamus and their connections to the cortex are similar. They're diffuse, spread out, and they're excitatory. So they just grossly arouse the cortex to, help to increase our level of uh, awareness so that we can do something. We can respond to this painful stimuli. So this kind of wakes you up. They're going to all act together to create that conscious perception of pain. Where does it hurt? I don't like that it hurts, and I will remember it, and I'm aware that it hurts, and I should do something about it. And that's it. Just three neurons, again. Well, we kind of cheated. There's a few different third neurons here. Any questions?
Well, let's see if we can handle these and then we'll move on. So we're going to uh, talk about unconscious perception. And then we're going to come back to pain. Because that was a little trickier for folks. So I want to end on that. Plus, we got to talk about the rest of the anterolateral tracts. So there are these offshoots that don't make it to the cortex. Therefore, you are not consciously aware of them. But they're doing stuff. And we're going to come back to them in the third point of this talk. More specifically, this spinal mesencephalic tract right here, where we stimulate the periaqueductal gray. That's kind of important. There are other offshoots along the way. This spinal olivary tract, that's going to stimulate our olive. The olive provides very strong input to the cerebellum to help modify the uh, circuitry within it so that we can learn, uh, at least non-conscious motor learning is what's going to happen when our olivary uh, nucleus is stimulated. And we'll talk about that again whenever we hit the cerebellum. But part of the input to help drive that olive input comes from pain. If you fall down and hurt yourself, this should tell you that you need to refine your circuitry for how to stand and walk. So this is probably very important early on. My girls fall down all the time because uh, they're just now getting their, their sea legs. They fall a lot. And so they're going to have that spinal olivary tract providing input to the olive to say we should, we should fix our cerebellum. This is not working. We keep falling down. Um, there's going to be input to the reticular formation as well. We'll hear about them whenever we talk about the brainstem in the next unit. But this is just a collection of brainstem nuclei that provide diffuse excitatory input to the cortex. They help keep us awake. This is kind of like the intralaminar nuclei in the thalamus. This is another source of cortical stimulation in response to pain. Again, you don't want to sleep through the pain. You want to be well aware of what's going on so that you can respond to it. That pain might be something nibbling on you, trying to make a meal of you, and you'd like to get away from it. So we have a secondary route to stimulate the cortex down here in the brainstem. And then there's this offshoot in the midbrain that's going to stimulate the periaqueductal gray and help provide negative feedback to this whole system. You always want to see this. You want to see negative feedback loops. If the signal isn't turning itself off, it runs the risk of becoming noise. And so here is going to be our negative feedback loop. It's pretty straightforward. Just a few neurotransmitters and receptors to get under your, under your cap. It'll make a whole lot of sense. Uh, other tracks that don't make it to the cortex but are certainly important would be those that run up to the cerebellum. So the spinal olivary tract is going to kind of indirectly hit the cerebellum via the olive. Uh, the spinal cerebellar tracts are going to more directly target the cerebellum so that it's aware of what are we feeling. So what's our body position? Your body position is going to affect what sort of movements you're going to execute if you want to, let's say, I don't know, pick this up. Well, my hand is closed. I know I need to open it. It's already open. I don't need to do that. Right? You need to be aware of your body position if you're going to properly regulate your movements. If you're starting to lean over, you want to make adjustments to your balance so that you don't fall over. All of these adjustments that are carried out by your cerebellum without you having to do any thought require some sort of feedback. And there's a couple routes for feedback. It depends on the location in the body, whether it's going to be our posterior spinal cerebellar tract or the cuneo cerebellar tract. In this case, rather than just running up along the posterior columns, the A beta afferents are going to make some local synapses along the way. For the posterior cerebellar tract, we're going to synapse locally in the spinal cord. This is also going to run up as well. Keep that in mind. But we're going to synapse locally in the spinal cord and create the posterior 
final cerebellar tract. So a different nucleus in this case, not the, not the nucleus uh, proprius, but in this case, uh, the dorsal nucleus. It's gonna handle different information. This is not pain. This is just feedback to, to create that non-conscious somatosensory input for the cerebellum. So we, we synapse locally, and then these neurons are gonna project up via the inferior cerebellar peduncles, once they hit the medulla, into the cerebellum. So we're providing some input about the lower body. What's the position of our lower limbs? The uh, upper limbs are gonna be handled along the cuneo cerebellar tract. So in this case, um, our A beta afferents are gonna project on up the posterior columns, and rather than synapsing the cuneate nucleus, there's this little offshoot called the accessory cuneate. It doesn't create the medial meniscus pathway. Instead, it projects to the cerebellum, again along the inferior cerebellar peduncle. Notice that these are ipsilateral. Input to the cerebellum is ipsilateral. No exceptions. Same side of the body here. It's contralateral in the cortex. The cerebellum remains ipsilateral. The input for both of these is going to be the inferior cerebellar peduncle. And this is just going to provide the cerebellum with essentially an instantaneous map of body position so that it can properly refine movement to make sure we don't fall over and that we execute movement smoothly. The actual movements that are taking place also get relayed back to the cerebellum via two different tracts. There's again lower and upper body. They're going to project along different tracts. So, not the posterior spinal cerebellar tract, but in this case, the anterior spinal cerebellar tract. So just in front of that. Again, we're gonna, lo uh, we're gonna synapse locally. Rather than getting immediate input from the body, instead, our, our sensory neuron here is gonna be located in between the dorsal and ventral horns in the spinal cord. So it's somewhere in between the sensory and motor portions of the spinal cord. It's gonna receive input essentially about the reflexive behaviors that are going on, any motor output. So this is, these neurons are gonna be privy to motor and sensory information that's going on within the spinal cord. In other words, what are we actually doing? Not plans, nothing like that. What's the actual activity in the spinal cord? Let's relay that back to the cerebellum. Since they're in between dorsal and ventral, we call it the intermediate zone. It's in between them. These are going to cross. They're going to cross locally and head up, not in the posterior, but in the anterior spinal cerebellar tracts. It's going to project all the way up until we hit our pons here. Then we're gonna head down in the superior cerebellar peduncle, so there's a bit of a difference. We've crossed, and we're using a different peduncle, but then we cross again, so it remains ipsilateral. It's a double cross. You gotta watch out for these, but it, it's still ipsilateral. Left side of spinal cord, left side of cerebellum. So all tracts are ipsilateral. This is still true. I realize that the crossing cross back but that makes it just ipsilateral. The upper limb portion of this is very minor, not well characterized. It's only from a couple different spinal sections, C7, C8, very minor tract. It probably also projects up to the superior cerebellar peduncle and double crosses. It might also just project directly via the inferior cerebellar peduncles. It's so small, we don't know a whole lot about it. This one's called the rostral spinal cerebellar tract. But again, there's a pair of tracts. These are for sensory input. What's my body position? These are for the motor output. What's my body doing? The cerebellum needs to know both of those so they can properly regulate our movements. If you're already leaning over a bit and you're executing a movement that's gonna further move your center of gravity away, uh, you need to adjust so you don't fall over. And your cerebellum is going to handle that without you thinking about it. Because notice, we didn't touch the cortex at all in any of these pathways. This is all unconscious. 
So whenever you get good at a movement, whatever that may be, whether it's throwing a ball or playing a scale, you do it with little thought. But it, it just happens. You just think, I want to play the F major scale. And then you run on up with little thought. Your cerebellum is handling that. Once you learn how to execute a movement, it happens without the cortex anymore. It doesn't really guide the actual fine movements. That's all going to be down here. And largely that's through trial and error. You do something, it doesn't work. All it says it doesn't work. And your cerebellum tries again. Any questions on this? All right. Let's go through these and then we'll talk about pain. The, the ending of pain, that is. Pain, like any other signal, needs to be terminated at some point or it becomes noise. There's a host of positive feedback loops that exist in nociceptive signaling. There's your axon reflex, peripheral sensitization, central sensitization. Pain has many ways of amplifying its signaling. So there needs to be some break in place, some check that's going to turn off pain. And you probably notice that pain is usually most intense right when it happens and then over time your, your, your cut will feel a little better. Part of that's healing and part of that's just natural painkillers. And because we have natural painkillers, we have to be very aware of placebo effects whenever we're doing any study with pain. Pain is self-limiting. It's going to turn itself off whether you do anything or not. So you always have to have some control group to get some idea of how much of this is contributing to your data. There's a few places where we're going to gate pain. One of them is pretty quick um, and it's going to be effective for very low levels of pain. And that's just right there locally in the spinal cord. That's what this is, believe it or not. So here's our spinal thalamic tract, primary afferent, secondary afferent. We're in the dorsal horn. There's a whole bunch of other stuff. Uh, the spinal cord contains its own logic. This is still a part of the central nervous system. And I think we all said at the beginning of class that the central nervous system is there for information processing. If you're gonna process information, you're gonna need more than just a direct synapse right here. You gotta have some circuits. And there's a lot of circuitry involved here. We're gonna simplify things. Don't sweat it, but there's a lot. There are, there are a variety of inhibitory neurons and excitatory neurons in place here. That's what creates our logic. That's what allows processing, having additional neurons there to refine whether or not this is going to be a strong synapse or a weak synapse. Well, if we stimulate a bunch of inhibitory neurons, like this one with GAD65, that's the enzyme we need to make GABA, and it's blue, so both of those things are telling us it's inhibitory, we can decrease activation of our nociceptive afferents. Alternatively, if you increase the activity of these excitatory interneurons, and they're all over the spinal cord, those can increase excitatory drive to our nociceptive afferents and allow for pain signaling to proceed through their spinal cord. While there is a lot going on here, let's just think about our primary and secondary afferent. So here's pain. If this gets activated, it's going to stimulate the thalamus and create some conscious perception of pain. If this isn't activated, it won't. We won't perceive pain. It gets excitatory input from its primary afferent, and then there are inhibitory inner neurons that are going to provide GABAergic or glycinergic input to decrease its excitability. So they're going to open up chloride channels and resist movement away from rest. Those get stimulated by these. Have we heard of A beta afferents before? Great, non painful, just tactile sensation. So if you bump your knee and you rub it, it feels just a little bit better. Here's why. Those, those tactile A beta fibers are going to be stimulated by the rub 
there are inhibitory neurons within the dorsal horn that will provide inhibitory input to nociceptive afferents. So after you bump, you rub to provide a little bit of GABA and glycine here at this synapse. So that you have decreased input along your spinal thalamic tract. Less pain. This only works for minor injuries. Anything more severe, we're going to have to we're going to have to resort to opioids. <laughs> but for something simple, this works, and you have to have this in place. I think we've all accepted that everything is mechanically gated to some degree, even your eyeballs. Undoubtedly, those A delta and C fibers are going to be mechanically gated. Part of their job is to sense what's going on in the body. Every time a part of your body receives pressure, these are going to get some degree of activation. We need to cancel that out so that everything doesn't hurt. If we didn't cancel that out, there would be minor activation of the spinal thalamic tract and a little bit of pain every time you're touched. That's not the case because of all of this. The spinal circuitry that says, if we have sufficient activation of non-painful fibers, we're probably just getting touched. It's probably just pressure. So it's the ratio of these things. And what helps bias it toward only non-painful sensation would be these inhibitory inner neurons. So that when someone's tapping our shoulder, both of these fibers are activated. But this activation gets shunted via these inhibitory inner neurons. And this is going to arrive first. A beta, much bigger, faster conduction velocity. This is going to arrive at the spinal cord first, stimulate some inhibitory inner neurons so they can dump GABA and glycine here and make sure we don't feel pain when we're not supposed to. And you can rub your knee and it'll feel a little bit better. Now, if your leg is cut off at the knee, you're going to need a little more than that. Rubbing it won't help. We're going to have to recruit exogenous opioids uh, nowadays, but before you just have to wait a while and let your spinal mesencephalic tract do its, do its uh, magic. We're going to start backwards here. I think that's going to help us understand this, but only going through this many, many, many times will help you understand it. I'm sorry. But it's really not that tough when you think about it. Many, many, many times. <laughs> There's two neurotransmitters that are going to help regulate pain. And they're going to arise from the brain stem. There's descending tracts that are going to allow them to spit out either norepinephrine or serotonin in the dorsal horn. And those are going to decrease nociceptive signaling in a couple different ways. The norepinephrine is pretty straightforward. Uh, Noradrenergic neurons in your locus ceruleus are going to release norepinephrine that's going to stimulate norepinephrine receptors. We need to know which kind, of course. In this case, it's alpha-2, and that's GI coupled. Excitatory or inhibitory? Fantastic. We're going to be activating long-lived inhibitory neurotransmitter receptors on our nociceptive fibers whenever we release norepinephrine from the locus ceruleus. The other neurotransmitter that's going to be dumped out there in the dorsal horn would be serotonin. This arises from a different nucleus, the raphe nucleus. The magnus raphe is just a, a large collection of serotonergic neurons. The raphe nuclei are going to run throughout your brainstem. We'll hear about them again. And when you hear raphe, you want to think serotonin. The magnus raphe nucleus is going to project downward into the spinal cord and release serotonin. It's also going to target the locus ceruleus so that we get additional noradrenergic input as well. So serotonin is going to do two things. It's going to act in the spinal cord. It's going to stimulate inhibitory neurons down there. Again, we need to know the receptor. Serotonin is going to act postsynaptically on 5-HG, that's just serotonin, 2-A and 2-C, both of which are GQ. Is that excitatory or inhibitory? Fantastic. We're going to increase calcium levels in our inhibitory neurons, so they're going to dump additional inhibitory neurotransmitter onto nociceptive afferents. So we're going to inhibit pain signaling via this inner neuron here. They'll also act presynaptically via cation channels. 
This is the only neuromodulatory channel that's actually ionotropic, 5-HT3. Everything else is metabotropic that we're dealing with. When the serotonergic neurons in the brachynuclei are stimulated robustly, they're going to release neuropeptides. Again, you have to burst fire if you're going to release neuropeptides. They're expensive, and they're held away from the active zone. When we have sufficient excitatory input to the raphe nucleus, they burst fire and they release substance P. This is what's going to activate neurons in the locus ceruleus. Substance P is going to bind to GQ-coupled neurotransmitter receptors. Are those excitatory or inhibitory? Fantastic. So we're going to excite noradrenergic neurons, so we're going to bump up this signaling. And what that's going to lead to is a reduction in nociceptive transduction. Let's have a look at why we think that. The x-axis is just showing us different time points. B1 would be baseline, 5 minutes or 15 minutes after they give a substance P injection. And then Y here, the y-axis is just the amount of pressure we had to apply to the paw to make them withdraw it. Paw withdrawal is going to take place whenever their paw hurts. The amount of pressure that you have to apply relates to the amount of nociceptive signaling that's taking place. What's that? This is a rat. Okay, you say paw, you say dogs. Okay, not dogs here, no, rats. Um, so, this is a common readout for pain signaling. When you burn the paw, this value drops. You need less pressure to cause pain. When you blunt nociceptive signaling, you need more pressure to cause pain and make them withdraw their paw from the filament. After we inject substance P, that's what SP is, along with some saline that doesn't do anything, you'll notice that the amount of pressure needed for them to withdraw the paw increases. So there's decreased painful signaling. You need more pressure to sufficiently activate those A delta and C fibers. Not the case if you antagonize our alpha-2 adrenergic receptors. And that's what this field bar is showing you. When you decrease noradrenergic signaling, in other words, when you block this, no decrease in painful signaling. So we need noradrenergic input in the spinal cord. That's what this is telling us. Substance P is somehow increasing the activity of noradrenergic neurons. And that is absolutely fundamental for this, for that anti nociceptive activity of substance P. Substance P needs its neurokinin 1 receptors because if we antagonize those, we see the same thing. Substance P still decreases nociceptive signaling, but only if you let it act on its receptor. Taken together, what this is telling us is that when substance P stimulates its neurokinin 1 receptor, we decrease nociceptive signaling. And that's because those neurokinin 1 receptors are located on our neurons in the locus ceruleus. They'll release norepinephrine that actually causes this, because without the activity of your alpha 2 adrenergic receptors, you don't see this decrease in pain signaling. So a couple different neurotransmitters there. Norepinephrine, serotonin are going to act down there in the spinal cord. Those serotonergic neurons also synapse in the locus ceruleus and release substance P to further recruit these norepinergic neurons. This is all going to be gated by opioids. We're going to continue our journey backwards away from the spinal cord. What's controlling that circuitry? The locus ceruleus, the magnus raphe. Well, that would be our periacrodocal gray. Neurons here provide excitatory input to the raphe. So if our periacrodocal gray projection neurons are active, they're going to provide excitatory input down here to the raphe nucleus. That's going to cause them to burst fire. They'll stimulate the locus ceruleus they'll also release serotonin locally in the spinal cord. So what determines whether or not we have stimulation of this pain gating has to do with whether or not neurons in our periaqueductal gray are active. Have we heard of anything that provides excitatory input to the periaqueductal gray? 
Oh uh, yeah, the anterolateral pathway. Yeah, there's an offshoot there. So when we have active pain signaling, we're going to provide excitatory input up here, right where we need it, to stimulate all that stuff that we just brought up. It's negative feedback. This is also going to be gated by higher brain structures. The hypothalamus is going to provide disinhibition to those projection neurons. So it's going to release an opioid called enkephalin that binds to mu opioid receptors. Those are GI coupled, excitatory or inhibitory. Fantastic. So we're going to inhibit inhibitory neurons in the periaqueductal gray. That's what this little cartoon is showing you here. Oops, we'll get to that in just a second. So when our hypothalamus provides enkephalin input into the periaqueductal gray, those neurons that are normally inhibiting our output neurons get inhibited. This is a common mechanism of activation. It's called disinhibition. We remove inhibition and that allows excitation via that spinal mesencephalic tract. When the periaqueductal gray is active, the raphe is active. When the raphe is active, the locus ceruleus is active. The raphe and locus ceruleus provide serotonin and norepinephrine to blunt the nociceptive signaling. Enkephalins are also going to come up down there in the spinal cord too. There's local release of opioids as well. So here's everything that's going on. Simplify. If we stimulate our periaqueductal gray, which we will if we're having any sort of pain, and we'll allow robust stimulation there if we have input from the hypothalamus to disinhibit the projection neurons. Output from the periaqueductal gray is going to activate these blue serotonergic fibers from the raphe, these, then via those, the green neuroadrenergic fibers from the locus ceruleus. What they are going to do down in the spinal cord is inhibit this, our anterolateral tract. Here's our primary afferent, lives out there in the dorsal root ganglion. Here we are in the nucleus proprius. There's that secondary afferent. It's going to cross the midline eventually and project on up. If we inhibit this synapse, we inhibit pain. We won't feel pain. So you can take some exogenous opioids and they'll act locally. They'll also act up in the periaqueductal gray as well. Or your hypothalamus could release them, stimulate periaqueductal gray, which then stimulates the serotonergic input. Serotonin is going to stimulate inhibitory neurons. These are going to provide GABAergic, lysinergic input <coughs> at this synapse they're going to shunt the excitation that's occurring there. When they burst fire, they're going to then release neuropeptides. The neuropeptide in this case is enkephalin. It's still going to bind to mu opioid receptors, in this case on our nociceptive afferents. Mu opioid receptors are still GI coupled, so are they still inhibitory? Absolutely. So we're going to inhibit quickly via GABA and glycine, and then over the long run, with enkephalin. We're going to provide a strong inhibition of this synapse. There's also that noradrenergic input as well from the locus ceruleus. That's also going to inhibit our nociceptive afferents. Not via mu opioid receptors, but through those alpha-2 adrenergic receptors. Same signaling under the hood though, GI coupled. So is that excitatory or inhibitory? Inhibitory. inhibitory. Fantastic. There's some different neurotransmitters, but they're all doing basically the same thing. There's inotropic and metabotropic inhibition going on here. Both of those are going to decrease the excitability of this pathway and blunt pain. This is how opioids are going to work. Now, despite what's going on in the periphery, there is no excitation of the secondary afferent there is no conscious perception of pain. And you'll notice here, we got a little negative feedback. Norepinephrine from the locus ceruleus is going to help turn this whole system off by decreasing activity of those serotonergic neurons in the rapid. That's just responsible signaling right there. The main thing that you need to worry about is the effect right here. How are we decreasing activation of that secondary afferent? 
If we can prevent it from firing, we can prevent ourselves from hurting. And there's many ways that we do it via inhibitory, fast synaptic signaling, or more long-lived inhibitory signaling. And that's it. Any questions? I know, pretty laughable, right? How could that be confusing? Say it a few times, it'll make sense, I promise. And if it doesn't, come see me. The pain will stop once you understand it. Uh, go through these and then we'll call it a class.